So what I wanted to show you here is that people's health organs are being damaged by having these very small amounts of pesticides for having them often throughout their lifetime. Well, and that was just looking at one pesticide, but the reality is, is that our regu regulatory authorities approve multiple types of pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, to be used in each crop. And all of them are generally used in a normal crop cycle. So this means that many foods, actually most foods, have multiple residues. There was a really good study just come out by the Environmental Working Group last week. Around 23 different pesticides in the average strawberries in the US. That's, that's the level of residues. When we test people, because we people eat more than one type of food, so they're getting a cocktail of uh, pesticides, most people have multiple residues in their body. And yet there is no requirement for testing of these chemical cocktails, even though they are approved, zero requirement to test. What the science shows that many of these mixtures are synergistic, one plus one can equal three, four, five, actually, we know it can equal a thousand in cases, not one and one equals two. With, you know, data shows up to 232 different chemicals found in the placental cord, you know, cord blood of newborns. And the trouble with our regulatory authorities is a data-free assumption to assume that there is no independent science shows that these, these um, chemicals can be hundreds and thousands of percent more toxic than than on their own. What I really want to talk about too, and, this, and I, I will end on this one because, um, so further down, I'll, I'll go into more detail, I mean, about this, is that the special requirements of the fetus, the newborn and the grown child in relationship to what they call developmental neurotoxicity. This is where small amounts of chemicals poison the nerves and stop them from developing properly. And this is another data-free assumption. And there is, once again, no regulatory approval process to specifically test for these groups. And the peer-reviewed science, and I'll go into detail about that later on in this presentation, shows that these groups are particularly vulnerable. Yeah, so what I... I'll just go back to where where we were before we lost signals and things. The the graph here is you know the standard four hundred year old concept of toxicity. The higher the more more you have, the more poisonous it is. The less you have, the less poisonous it is. And it seems fairly logical, but um, and to a degree, it's true for a lot probably most most things but it's not true of all things and there is what what modern science has discovered that there's an effect called a non-monotonic dose and that is when you start getting down to a very low levels there can be an increase in toxicity it's not a straight line and many pesticides and also a lot of the um plasticizers you know, in, um, in other compounds used in our food wrappings and detergents and, and uh, cl children's toys and makeup, many of these compounds become more toxic at the lower dose and they actually act like hormones at these doses. They interrupt, they disrupt our normal hormone systems. And Health requires hormones to be in balance. It's called homeostasis. When you start interfering with them uh, and our hormones go out of balance, the whole of our health goes out of balance. What we find with a lot of these chemicals, and there's 
at, at least um, 400 known pesticides and ingredients in pesticides that act this way, not one or two, they can act like estrogen and interfere with the normal development, particularly in the children and the fetus, interfere with their normal development of um, the whole sexual hormone side. But there's others that also interfere with thyroid and, and many other hormones. But if we just talk about the ones that act like estrogen, later in life, they are implicated in the epidemic of cancers of the sexual tissues that we have, which is breast, ovarian, cervical, endometrial, pr prostate, and testicular cancers. They are also implicated in numerous reproductive problems. You know, at the moment, endometriosis is, 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 is really a silent pandemic that you know, the medical profession is only starting to recognise, doesn't know what to do about it. Ovarian in, insufficiency, which is a major issue in people having tr trouble you know, having families. We're seeing falling sperm counts, which is another major contributor contributor, abnormal sperm, and then birth defects in, in, in young boys. And we, we actually have data now knowing that this can actually be caused by our grandparents' exposure, because the fact is, um, the egg we came from formed inside our mothers when she was being formed inside our grandmother. Our grandmother's exposure can affect us today. And our exposure can affect our grandchildren. The other one we're told is that the new pesticides aren't like the bad ones, like the bad old DDT, you know, and they break down rapidly. Well, if that was the case, you know, they break down rapidly and they biodegrade and we don't have to worry about them. Why do we have to have maximum residue levels and acceptable daily intakes? Why? Because they leave residues in food. And we know multiple residues of multiple pesticides in food. And most people have them. The other thing, too, that the other mythology is, oh, when they break down, they go down to nothing. They just disappear, harmless. There are whole groups of pesticides. When they break down, they become more dangerous, more toxic, more residual. Hundreds of times, in fact. And there's a lack of testing about that. It's a major issue in um, pesticide residues. This idea, oh, look, you know, uh, the residues are so small and uh, that, that they're biodegrading. Yes, they are biodegrading, but now they are worse and more toxic. <laughs>